Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the final day of the Culturally Competent Conversations for Equity and Belongingness Summit. It is day three, and today is all about how do we build a, you know, what is it going to take for us to build a culturally competent society for all of us and for our future? With that in mind, you know, um, before I introduce our keynote speaker, this is a very, very special keynote because of who our speaker is. Um, before that, just a couple of housekeeping notes. Make sure you comment on YouTube or Facebook, whether you're watching this live or later, so that we can address them. We are monitoring our comments even after the summit. So if you have any questions, please make sure you comment whenever you look at this, and we will make sure that we get them to the speaker and get your questions answered. This summit and future um, programming would not be possible if not for our amazing sponsors and partners who believed in this dream and who decided to walk the walk with me toward equity, toward belongingness and toward intentional inclusion. So a huge thank you to Essential IT, my web team, who's been, like I was telling uh, Dr. Harris, my spine for these past three days and in designing this whole summit, uh, Defy the Status Quo Marketing, who it has taken care of all of the content on the blogs and the social media that you see, Zanzibar Enterprises and the Nielsen Company for, for your generous contribution. So thank you, thank you to all of you. And thank you to the individual donors who donated uh, whatever you were comfortable with. Every single penny counts to where, you know, when we are doing programming like this that impacts and goes out to thousands of people. So you can still donate if you go to www.c3eb.com and we would appreciate and we honor your contributions by putting it into programming like this. That being said, it is my absolute pleasure now to tell you about Dr. Kenneth L. Harris, our keynote speaker for this session. Um, Dr. Kenneth L. Harris is known for his innovative style and visionary approach to addressing societal and economic challenges within black and brown communities. Born and raised in Detroit, Dr. Harris started the International Detroit Black Expo Incorporated, IDBE, which hosted more than 1,000 exhibitors from around the globe and reached 300,000 consumers, becoming one of the largest expositions in the entire country in just five years. The Honorable Dr. Harris was also elected to the Detroit Charter Commission by 40,149 votes in a highly contested citywide race featuring 54 candidates. Dr. Harris also serves as a pre, or served as the president slash CEO of Michigan Black Chamber of Commerce, which became the largest black chamber in the country with more than 3,200 members. Dr. Harris became the 12th president and CEO of the National Business League, NBL, founded by Booker T. Washington in 1900 encompassing more than 150,000 members and 365 local leagues with access to 2.9 million black owned businesses across the country. Dr. Kenneth L. Harris graduated with a BA in psychology and an MA in counseling and clinical psychology from Clark Atlanta University in Atlanta, Georgia. He also received a Doctor of Humane Letters from Detroit's Lewis College of Business and an Educational Specialist EDS degree from Wayne State University in Educational Leadership and Policy Studies. Dr. Harris earned a dual PhD at Michigan State University in African American and African Studies and economics with a specialization in business and entrepreneurship from the Eli Broad School of Business. In addition to that, Dr. Harris is somebody that I get to call one of like my most favorite unofficial mentors. He always gives me the truth. He always pushes me to test my own limits, reach out of my comfort level and keep growing. And for that, I am so grateful. And also that he agreed to do this keynote. So without further ado, Dr. Harris, welcome to the C3EV Summit. Oh, thank you so much. And to uh, outstanding and mostly fantastic uh, several days of just courageousness, strength, courage, truth telling, right frequency, high vibration, 
and so much positive energy. So with that, I thank you, Dr. AJ, for your leadership, your courage, again, your truth telling, bringing so many bright minds together from across the world uh, that have yet to have this earnest conversation and dialogue, which is so much needed today. Um, I'm going to be frank with the audience, um, if you don't mind, uh, Dr. A. Take it away, please. Um, and I'm going to speak uh, really about 400 years later, not our story, 1619 to 2019, to really level set and create the narrative, which is so important to our communities as we're experiencing so much today. Uh, today, uh, we want to set the record straight. Uh, as we are witnessing not only a health crisis, but an economic crisis, which are synonymous with each other. Uh, before the COVID-19 pandemic, there were 11 million minority owned businesses in America that employed more than 6.8 million jobs in this country and generated more than $1.8 trillion in annual revenue. This is tremendous. This says that Blacks, Hispanics, Latin America, Native American, Indigenous, and Asian Indian Americans contributed not only collectively $1.8 trillion to the total revenue in the economy, but this has been our skin in the game economically, if that makes any sense. But with me being an economist, we have to illuminate the data because if you can't measure it, it doesn't exist. And if it doesn't exist, then you can't create change. But as black people in this country, we have toiled this land under extreme opposition for more than 450 years. It is purely because of black people, our fight against white supremacy, oppression and racism, black people's pure blood, sweat, and tears that America has a conscience. And here we are again today in 2020, marching yet again in the street, unified in solidarity across the globe, saying and signifying that black lives matter. As melanated people, black and brown men and women gunned down in the streets of America time after time again, by the historically white supremacist and racist organization founded on the slave plantation to round up the slaves and protect white economic interests, police brutality shall not and will not be tolerated any more from the rogue and racist cops running the, in, running the streets in the name of those who protect and serve and do the right things in our beloved community. It is because of black people that we have women's rights, immigration, civil rights and liberty, freedom from the slave shackles of segregation and extreme racist hatred that we still see the tenants of today. It is because of black people that all other racial and cultural groups or melanated people of black and brown skin have the right to vote eat in public places, seek job opportunities, raise families in diverse environments. It is because of black people that we have diversity and inclusion, supplier diversity in corporate America, and we all have the opportunity to fight for and experience equal opportunity. We have to set the narrative straight because as Marcus Garvey once said, a tree without its roots, it's like a people without its history. And so we have to go back and make sure that our history is in the forefront of our minds as we all come together to fight for true equality, equity, and inclusion. All of this off of the backs of black men and women who fought their way off the plantation, who gained freedom from that plantation, fought against the extreme settler colony of white supremacists and all opposition of this regime towards freedom and equality for all. Black people are owed an incredible great debt by this country. 
And as you see today in solidarity with our allies, as black people fight for freedom, so shall the rest of the world become free. Today, I acknowledge in the spirit, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, George Floyd, Rashard Brooks, and yet again, a young man unarmed, shot in the back seven times, Jacob Blake, who is in the hospital fighting for his life today. Let's continue to set the record straight. There is no such thing as race. There is only one humanity. Race, in fact, was created by the white ruling class elite in the late 17th century, enforced by a wicked policy of control and oppression. Race was in fact created and invented as a socioeconomic control mechanism over a mythological scheme that white skin is superior. And rather, this is a sick ideology. It still pervades today all across the globe. Race never existed in terms of policy before the 17th century. And even the first people who arrived on this land, both indentured servants, all colors were represented, never identified by their race. Matter of fact, prior to the existence of race, even with the settler colonies, all men were at an equal status. Black men were able to marry white women. White women were able to marry black men. Black families were able to own land. There was equality. There was a, a, a contract in place for people to take advantage of their full lives. But soon later came this invention which we call race today. Black and brown people all over the world are now experiencing in the form of caste systems and racial hierarchy, what it feels like to be oppressed. Race is a sickness that plagues the world and humanity and the gig is up. All people all around the world are tired of identifying by the color of their skin rather than the content of their character. Black people and humanity will no longer accept as we have never accepted white supremacy, its culture, its oppressive agenda, nor its institutions, structures, and systems that keep the that white ruling class in power, continuously manipulating the masses of black and brown people in this world. So let's talk history. Let's have fun today. When we think about his story, capital H-I-S-T-O-R-Y, we think about 1619 when the first African indentured servants and slaves arrived in Virginia 400 years ago. But this isn't the story of black people. In fact, there is no evidence that not, there is now evidence that not only were black people in America long before Chris, Christopher Columbus landed in Cuba, a, a person who never set foot actually in the true United States of America, but we actually have evidence in DNA and structure in terms of support towards indigenous natives that were black who roamed this land who procreated with the Asian migration thousands of years ago, creating the Native American populations that we see today. If you haven't read the book, They Came Before Columbus by Dr. Ivan Van Sertiman or Dr. David M. Hotep, the first Americans were Africans. So as we begin to build our true history back up and rid the false history the Europeanized or whitewashed history that has plagued this world, we can now set the record straight. Black people's story did not start with slavery. White supremacy and racism, which was created only after the 17th century, robbed African-Americans and black people and indigenous people of their true culture, history, and legacy. 
Our story didn't start in 1619. Our story started hundreds of thousands of years ago, going back to ancient Kemet along the Blue Nile and the Kush Empire and Valley in Africa. And yes, believe that what we call Egypt today was known as ancient Kemet. Thousands of years upon the invention of white people, religion, mental, physical enslavement of black people and melanated folks all across the world, the original people of this planet who were known as humans, not by their race. Not only were we builders of vast kingdoms and helped modernize civilization long before there was a Europe, a Greece, a Rome, or an Asia, but we were some of the most visionary and innovative and entrepreneurial minds on the planet. And if you go back to the ancient kingdom and you look into the Nile Valley and you study the hieroglyphics and you look at the tremendous amount of legacy that has been left before us, you will be amazed. I say all this to say, 400 years later, we've tried the European way, the ideological way of capitalism, its sacred colonized form of westernized living, and most importantly, we have alluded to the fact that this system has not worked for a rather tribal group of people. The slavery experiment, which entrapped minds, bodies, and souls, never kept us away from our natural incarnation. We are now returning back to who we truly are with mind, body, soul, and spirit balance, with connectivity to all, with unique alignment with the universe, with unique alignment with the cosmology, with unique alignment with the earth, the fire, the water, the air, and all natural elements of how we exist. We are truly one people. We are truly one race. If there was an identification, we are truly one humanity and we shall rid this world of the evil incarnation of race. As I profess being a proud vegan, living a complete plant-based life, away from the process genocide occur occurring in the black community and other urban or scenarios where ethnic groups are experiencing the same things in terms of food that we put into our bodies. I, I'm also a proud yogi, as if I've returned to our spirituality that has existed beyond the controls of different aspects of how people view their spirituality. That empowers my soul, my mind, and my spirit to be one with the creators, the ancestors, and those who innovated long before us to attribute to the progress that we are attaining today. What we are today are an amazing people. What we are today is a people that we're realizing we don't have to be dependent on the system. We don't have to be dependent on something that was created for someone else's benefit. We truly are entrepreneurs. Whether we have a career, we can still be entrepreneurship minded, but most of us are finding out that we would rather put our complete passions and energies into not only something that can build generational wealth, but can create opportunities for independence and our own freedom to be attained. We are now returning back to mind, body, soul, and spirit balance that allows for us to subserve the ugliness of what racial caste has done to so many people throughout the land. Even as slaves, the system tried their best to stop even black people's entrepreneurial and industrial spirits. But I tell you, even during that time, we created multimillionaires. And I don't know if you all have heard the story of Free Frank McWhorter, who was a founder of the New Philadelphia in Illinois and in 1836 became the first African-American founder of an American town who made millions and owned acres upon acres of land. We call him today Free Frank. 
Free Frank eventually purchased, purchased his family of six teams total freedom due to his entrepreneurial endeavors. These are amazing stories during slavery that we have to unearth, that we have always wanted our freedom and to attain our economic heights of prosperity, which are available to us. Another story, Benjamin Carr, who did farm work in 1862 from $30 a year, acquired a small tract of land for $100 and three decades later, owned more than 400 acres of land near Hartsville, Tennessee, as, we, as he became one of the national speakers, even of my organization, the National Business League, organized in Louisville, Kentucky. And he delivered an address called Succeeding as a Farmer. Think about these scenarios during an, a, a demotrious point in time in history, in history. Think about a young lady, Elizabeth Cakely, known as Mary Todd Lincoln's a dressmaker and owned the largest custom dressmaking business in Washington, DC in 1860. Not only was she incredible in making dresses, she dressed the wives of Jefferson Davis and even Robert E. Lee. The entrepreneurial spirit has always been within all of us. Or think about last but not least, Another great story, Mary Ellen Pleasant, who was forced to assume two identities by the California Slave Act in 1852, who entrepreneurially created a fortune that amassed $30 million as a cook servicing mostly influential men and leveraging secrets and favors and eventually became an abolitionist and turned entrepreneur who used her money to take ex-slaves and fight for their freedom against the California Slave Act. This is what freedom, equity, and equality is all about. You cannot have health without wealth. You can't have wealth without health. And you can't have not only freedom and prosperity with your own economic means to be able to provide for yourselves and your families. Out of this story goes on and on, which brings us here to 400 years later, folks. 400 years, how far have we come? Well, some would question, not far at all. Even 56 years later, post the Civil Rights Act, which was fought for through the blood, sweat, and tears of black people in the streets to bring equality to this nation we still see systemic barriers that exist. Post Reconstruction 1865 was one, probably one of the most successful periods of advancement post slavery ever in the history of this country. This is where you had the first United, black United States congressmen, black United States governors, black United States senators. Politically, we excelled. We excelled in education with PhDs and in medicine with MDs. And this is right off of the plantation with no formal education, only an entrepreneurial spirit to make a way better in a short period of time. But even during this tremendous success, it didn't last long. Why? Because the system sprung up against us. They gave us 40 acres and a mule and they took it back. They gave us the first black bank in re during the reconstruction period called the Freedmen's Bank. And they stole from the bank and shut the bank down with all of the black men and women who fought in the world, the world war, the civil war to end what we call today a divided front. They put in place black codes, which were policy endorsed by governments to make sure that blacks could not participate in the economy. Even when we became segregated, we went to form our own black Wall Streets all across the country and throughout this land, owning airports and grocery stores and gas stations and building multi-million dollar communities and 
terroristic activity came in place with the KKK and lynching to make sure that these communities were bombed and burned to the ground so that black people could never have entrepreneurial independence. Then came in place Jim Crow segregation and separate but equal laws that made sure that black people never entered the economic mainstream of society. And then we got affirmative half action where we were taught to get a piece of the pie instead of the whole pie. And then we got civil, no economic rights, which means that yes, civil liberties are afforded today, but without economic opportunity, we remain at a stalemate. And so we see ourselves, even in this current situation, in 2020, 56 years later, post-civil rights, and we still see black and brown people at the bottom of the economic scale. But I can tell you this, as the 12th president since Booker T. Washington, who founded the organization that I now lead, we are now celebrating our 120th year anniversary as a organization to support black business. This is now our time to unite throughout the globe. We miss the agricultural age because in America, if you were black or brown, you were not only enslaved, but you were picking cotton. And this didn't allow for us to participate in the agricultural prosperity of this country because we were working for free. We were marginalized and singularly success during the industrial age, but because of Jim Crow segregation and black codes and restrictive laws that kept us away from the economic prosperity of this country, only a few were able to succeed. But now we will not miss the technology age because the revolution this time will not be televised, it will be digitized. And so thinking of the National Negro Business League, an American organization today that I now lead, which was founded 120 years ago, founded and composed by black men and women who just wanted to achieve economic and business success. They did that even in the early 1900s. The organization grew to thousands of members, hundreds of chapters all across the country and attracted the likes of Andrew Carnegie, William Taft, John D. Rockefeller, and the multi-billionaire companies that exist today who were in part successful because of black labor. And in 1966, the league was renamed from the National Negro Business League to today what we call the National Business League. And in the essence of where we are in 2020, now a part of a digital revolution, this organization is primed to not only advocate on behalf of entrepreneurial activity, but more importantly, economic prosperity amongst our community. It is so important that I mention this to you because this is a time to mobilize and organize as a people, as eth ethnic groups, and as communities all across this land. It is time for us to come together and build economic enterprise. Even in the early 1900s, Organizations that you see in place today were founded out of the National Negro Business League, such as the National Bankers Association, the National Medical Society, the National Association of Black Accountants, the National Black Journalist Press Association, the National Black Funeral Homes Directory, the National Black Retailers Association and real estate dealers, and so many black organizations came to be so that we can organize and build the communities that we want to see for ourselves against the institutions and structures that rejected and excluded us. I can tell you, this is an exciting time. Organize, organize, organize. Folks, it's time to set the record straight. It's time to organize on a global platform. How do we do it? What do we focus on? We have mastered the trade association game. We are now playing chess, not checkers. We are no longer being trapped and isolated and marginalized and limited 
either because of our skin or because of any other factor that we are now fighting for today to free ourselves up. This is the time again. The revolution won't be televised. It will be digitized. We will now measure outcomes with access to commerce, certification, supplier development, community reinvestment, economic inclusion, political advocacy, resource deployment and technical assistance, talent placement and acquisition. There are no barriers today. We are seeking balance. We are benefiting from the universe, the cosmos. We are benefiting from the fire, the air, the water, the earth. We are balanced mind, body, soul, and spirit. We are uniting. We are coming together as a people. This we can measure, folks. Not only as we say we're networking, not only to create a network worth something, but we are also at the same time building enterprise. The game has changed tremendously. Now we must prepare for the future. The changing of our economies are before us, as this is now a knowledge-based and technology-driven economy. We can achieve this together. We can join together in making sure that prosperity rings for all and that we eliminate any barriers that exist in terms of institutions, structures, and systems. Now that we have corrected what has been transpiring over 400 years by making the record straight, we can now focus on tearing down these oppressive structures that exist and rebuilding the humanity in the world that we see for ourselves as free human beings, focusing on wealth creation and the greatest transfer of wealth in this next generation will happen with us because of us. So folks, I thank you for this opportunity. I thank the organization of culturally competent conversations for equity and belongingness. I thank the phenomenal leadership of Dr. AJ and the supportive team that she has in place. I thank the speakers who have come together this week to say that we must set the record straight. I thank all of the phenomenal work that is being done in communities today. I thank the world for speaking up against white supremacy, racism, and oppression in all of its institutions, structures, and systems. It is now time for change. We will not accept not only the mythological and invented scenario that we should be judged by our skin rather than our character. The gig is up and I look forward to working with all of you throughout the future and best of luck throughout the remainder of this conference. Change has come because we are coming together. Thank you so much. Wow. I, I mean, as usual, I'm sitting here with just chills and goosebumps the whole time you were talking and that was so powerful. Thank you. Thank you. And yes, you're right. Change has come because we are coming together. Um, so as, profound. So as, profound. One, as one humanity with no race, just mind, body, spirit, and our incarnation to live our full lives in total freedom. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so thank much, you. Dr. Harris. This was Absolutely. Oh my God, so brilliant! Um, and you know, as um, once the comments, I know that you know, people when they watch later, as is happening with a lot of these recorded videos, um, when the comments come in, I'll definitely be reaching out to you and saying, "Can you answer this person's question for me?" <laughs> so, but thank you, thank you for you're welcome. For, um, bringing your brilliance and for you know enlightening us and blowing our minds with i mean a lot of those stories that you talked about today i i had no idea these are definitely not taught in schools and unless we learn about them through people you know in in one way it's really interesting it reminds me of how 
we started with the tradition of oral history, which is how we were able to maintain our heritage and legacy so well. And when it went to the written system that our narrative started getting changed. And now that we're, you know, with this kind of oral history that you've given us, we can create a new path of relearning what our legacies um, you know, have been, what our ancestries have been, and that's it, you've given us such a profound gift with that. So thank and, you. And Dr. AJ, it's 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 unfortunate that we have to set the narrative straight, but it's gonna happen anyway. Most of it's oral, a lot of it is factual, a lot of it is written in stone, uh, a lot of it is buried, uh, a lot of it has been covered up. Uh, so, you know, as we start to unearth during this technology age, uh, the truth uh, about humanity and our unique likeness uh, as humans, uh, it, we are 99.9% .9 all the same in yes. terms of biology. Absolutely. <laughs> and so when we think of that, there, there is nothing that separates us in gender race, creed, color, or sexual orientation. We have to get past the status-oriented ways of, of separating society and choosing winners and losers. Uh, this is not the way of the future and nature will not allow for it to exist. Uh, so as you see all of the structures uh, that we are traditionally attuned to uh, over this past 150 years are being torn apart uh, the truth is coming out. Uh, women are not subjected to being submissive and glorified secretaries anymore. You know, women are queenly and can rule the world and change the world and lead the world. And, and men can do all of the things necessary to make sure that there is truth and relevance in everything that we do to hold our families together. And so I'm excited about the future. I'm very proud, Dr. AJ, of you and all of the next generation of young leaders in this country, uh, just really challenging the status quo, showing so much love, positive energy, bringing balance to the world, uniting in a way that is just unmeasurable in its impact. Thank so congratulations, you. Dr. AJ. This is just the beginning. We got to do the work. So keep those uh, uh, your elbows and sleeves rolled up because yeah. we have work to do and we need you out here. And so many people that are accompanied with you. It's not just Dr. AJ. Yeah. This is a united global front that we are putting together and we will not be stopped. There will be freedom for all. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so much again um, for for sh shining so much light on, 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 on so much that we need to learn. It was brilliant. And um, for all of our viewers, whether you're watching live or later, make sure you comment so that we can answer your questions. We will be monitoring our comments even after the summit. And uh, once again, as a parting note, thank you to our partners and sponsors who've made this possible and who are walking the walk with us. And again, final thank you to Dr. Kenneth L. Harris uh, for, for just such a brilliant, brilliant keynote. And we'll see you in the next session in just a few minutes for our daily panel discussion um, on what is it going to take to build a comp culturally competent society. Um, so we'll see you in that session very shortly. <laughs> Bye.